Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. So, the first programming homeworks. This this kind of looks weird to me. Is that does that look good? Or let's try some. Is that too, too dark? It's mm -hmm. kind of like nap time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll try that. If that doesn't work, you'll let me know. Or maybe it's these. Yeah. Okay. At any rate, so now we've posted uh, some programming homeworks. I saw. <laughs> Someone started to do the first programming homework within like 90 seconds. That was incredible. Uh, you must have been sitting right by your computer, I guess. So any question about, about that? Yes? That's because uh, none of the programming homeworks have a due date with the exception of the end of the semester, obviously. Uh, because, what's today, the 20? Third, yeah. Fourth, yeah, fourth, yeah. None of them have any specific due date because uh, two, two, two major reasons. One reason is that um, from my, te my teaching point of view is I don't really care if you know the material uh, in the second week. All that I really need is for you to know the material by the end. That's all that I really need. And that's all that you really need. Uh, but another thing is, is that if you ever find yourself developing software, writing programs in a professional setting, there aren't, I mean, every, every professional task has a due date, but software in particular, the way it actually ends up working is you write something and then, okay, it's not quite right, and then you fix it, and then someone says, okay, it's better, but still not quite right and then you fix it and you just keep going through this cycle. That's what really happens. That's what's going to happen in our class. Every time you submit something, then I, I run my program, which grades it, and then my program will say what, what is right and what's not right and what you need to fix, and you just keep doing this over and over again. Other questions? Yes? So you say it keeps happening. No. It's just like completion. Yeah. Right. Okay. You, you'll, you'll get credit for every aspect of the program that you do correctly. You'll, you'll get, to, to be clear, you'll get full credit for every aspect of the program that you do correctly. E even if it takes you four, four tries or four 40 tries. Yes? Um, I noticed that like the uh, first actually doing anything in MATLAB, like making our own function, is until like the third ish homework. Mm -hmm. um, is that like because it's kind of like up to us to complete everything as we go or is it because we do it in, in class like in the lab or? The, the, in, the intention, the design is that all of those homeworks that, are, that, that I posted yesterday, you're going to do all of them on Tuesday. Oh, okay, wow. There's going to be a lot of homeworks and that they're going to, oh, many of them are going to be little bitty bites. Like the first homework, like I said, some, someone, one of you, was able to do it in about 90 seconds. A very small bite. Other questions? Okay, yes? We don't get to turn up the written homeworks early? Not early, no. Not early because there's about 70 or so of you. And um, that means that in the end, we're going to end up exchanging lots and lots and lots of papers. So I can't be handling special cases. Someone wants to turn in their homeworks early or whatever. So the written homeworks have to be due when they're due. Do we have a syllabus? Yeah, I, I posted a link to it. On, di did I? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I got so, much, so many irons in the fire. <laughs> it's hard to remember what I've done. Uh, so it, there's a there's a link posted. Other questions? Okay. So the 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 question that we had ended with was um, the following. 
suppose that we're given uh, x in the reals and f a function from reals to reals and in uh, a natural. So given these three, we want to make a new function. Want a function. <coughs> Mm, I'll call it C of what? In X and F. And we want it to produce, so which produces <coughs> F in of x. So was anybody able to make any headway on this one? So this was the last question that we posed last time. Yeah? Um, so if n is equal to 0, then it's x. If n is equal to 1, then it's f of x. And otherwise, you have to call the function again with the same function with n decremented by 1. and for the, the third <coughs> argument, you have to put f of x instead of x. Okay, that sounds good. So, <coughs> so let's let's go through the the base cases. So it sounded like you had some some base cases in mind. So c of n, x, and f. And it sounded like you said that one of the one of the simple cases is when n is zero. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what should the what should the answer be then? Should just be x. Well, see, it, we want to produce this. So I agree that f to zero would be id of x. I agree. I agree. So making a comment down here that f with superscript zero, this is id of x. But then, my, then my, the question becomes, then what is f0 of x in that case? Well, it would be id of x, but what's id of x? x. It's x. So in the case that n is 0, what is the correct output for c? x. OK. So you mentioned a second. Uh, a second base case. Strictly speaking, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But but let's write it anyway, just because sometimes it helps when you're first learning this kind of thing. Another kind of simple case is that what if what if n is one? Then what should the answer be? It should be f of x. Okay, then we could go down the line. We could make like 12 base cases, right? We could go all the way down to down to 12. So, for example, I could say I could say if n is 2, then we're supposed to do f of f of x like that, right? But strictly speaking, neither one of these is going to be necessary because the recursive case is going to handle all of them. Okay, so I hope you understand what I mean when I say I, we could keep writing it, right? I could go, when n is 3, it's f of f of f of x. Okay, so now we want uh, the recursive case. Okay, so then that means that we're going to have c of something, 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 otherwise. Well, let's think about it for a little bit. The first argument represents n. 
And the first argument is how is the only thing that's going to ever make this process stop. What does the first argument have to get to in order for this process to ever stop? Sure. It's got to get to zero, right? Because that's the only case, <laughs> ignoring these. The first argument has to get to zero, otherwise this thing will just keep recursing forever. So what, needs to, what does the first argument need to be? N minus one. N minus one. Okay. <clears throat> so then, um, what does the second argument need to be? X should just be X. F of X. It has to be F of X. It has to be F of X because what I want you to think about is that the first argument, in a sense, represents how many more times do we have to apply F? And so, so by, by applying it once here, that means that we only have n minus 1 more evaluations to go. Okay, then what should be here? Just F, right? So let's, yes? Can you write it, could you write it F of the whole function C? No, because the, the C, C has signature, naturals, because the first argument is a natural, cross reals, and then here's, here's where we get to something interesting now. What kind of thing is F? <laughs> Strictly speaking, y'all don't need to know this. It's a function which takes reels to reels, and then this produces a reel. So C has signature, a natural, a reel, a function which takes reels to reels, and it produces a reel. So you can't say F of C because what kind of thing does F want? It wants a reel, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you give it C, then it then it will say, I don't know what yeah. that is. So let's do an example to, to make it clear. So for example, <coughs> suppose that uh, <coughs> we'll say C of 5, and then we'll give a specific x, how about 2, and then we'll keep f abstract. So what should... What should we, what should this end up producing? Right, it'll, it'll be five evaluations, fi a five-fold composition of F, and all of that evaluated at two. So after we do this, this should be, this should be F five of two. Which is to say, if we were to write this without exponents, without exponents, how would you write this? <coughs> f of f of f of f, that's four of them, of f of two. Uh, so one, two, three, four. So that's what it should produce for us. So let's see, let's see if this C function, the way we've written it, will do it. Let's see if it will do it. And I'm going to ignore these. These are, these are legitimate base cases, but I'm going to ignore them. <clears throat> so if we're, so I'm going to call this case one, and this one case two. <clears throat> so to evaluate this, which case are we in? We're in case two, right? So that means that this call, this, this evaluation of C is equivalent to another evaluation of C. What is the new first argument? Four. What is the new second argument? F of two. F of two. And what is the new third argument? F. That's just following this rule here. Okay, so what we're saying is that whatever this is, not sure what it is yet, it's got to be the same as this, according to the rule. So now, for this one, which, which case are we in? Again with two, right? 
Why are we in, in case two? Because the first argument, because the first argument is non-zero. OK. So that means that this evaluation of C must be the same as this other evaluation of C that we're about to make. So what is the new first argument? Three. What is the new second argument? F of F of two, right? You have to put another F around whatever the second argument is. So this would be F of F of two. And the new third argument is just repeated. F. Any question about that? Okay. So now we want to evaluate this. Which case are we in? The second case, right? We're never going to be in the first case until the first argument becomes zero. But do you, do you observe that the first argument is counting down? Right? It's five and then four and then three. We've got a couple more to go. So this would be C of two. And then what is the new second argument? <laughs> right, it's F of all that business, whatever was passed in as the second argument. So this is F of F of F of two. OK. <clears throat> So now that's going to be the same as C of 1. And then F of F of F of F of 2. That one, that one, that one. <laughs> it's getting crazy, huh? So many parentheses. <laughs> I should have chosen a smaller number than 5. I think the point would have gotten across just as well. That's fine. So now the new first argument is 0. And then f of f of f of f of f of 2, that one, that one, that one, that one, f. So coming to here, using this one, we needed to use the second clause to come to that conclusion, the second clause to come to that conclusion, the second clause to that conclusion, the second one to get to here, the second one to get to here. And now finally, we want to evaluate this. Which clause will we use and why? Hopefully the first one because the first term is zero. Right, and we ran out of, I'm going to run out of space anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't that case. So the answer is because the first argument is zero, that means that the answer is the second argument. OK. So that's f of f of f of f of f. That's five of them. And then close, 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 close. So does it, does it do it? Yes. OK, do you see that, that this definition of C would produce an, uh, an n-fold comp composition for any n, even if it was some big n like 2,370? Yes? It's just, it's just some function. It could be anything. It could be like a polynomial or something. So I just want you to think of it abstractly. Other questions? Yes? So I'm kind of confused. I, I see it when you made kind of your rules. I see how you have like where n0, it's x, n equals 1, it's f of x, right? Mm -hmm. But like um, in the actual like c of all that stuff, how come you add a new x every time you subtract a new? Like, how come you, like, you know, it starts as, like, when it goes down to 4, you do f of 2, and then when it goes to 3, you do f of f of 2. Like, where, where is that coming from? Okay. So, I'm going to call this now red box. I'm going to call this red box. And then the red box is what goes inside of f. Supposing that you find yourself in the second case, the red box is what gets put in the f. So I have a question for you here. In this first evaluation, what's in the red box? Two. Two. So that's what gets put inside of the F. OK. Now, I'm going to have to use a different color now for the green box. Now, this is the whole second argument here. What gets, 
Yeah. What gets put in the F? That that whole thing. So that whole second argument gets put in the F. So as far as as far as parsing is concerned, this this is just one thing. So if we're going to evaluate this, this line, we have to use the second clause. And that whole blue box has to be put in the F. Yes? So does the domain of the function C change once you start applying the uh, like rule? Because it changes from, like the second argument changes from just reals to reals and true reals. Does it doesn't it, or does it not? Oh, it's just a real. Okay. Oh, right. It's an evaluation. Yeah, the second argument is a real. <clears throat> Good. Other questions? Interesting things. Interesting. <clears throat> so, one of the things that you're going to have to do in MATLAB is coming to grips with the following kind of thing that you already know. So this is a review of, of material you already are quite familiar with. And that is that <coughs> if you are given functions, F and G, and they have, and they're both, they both have signature. Uh, real to real, and they both have. Uh, well, I'll just leave it, leave it that way. That's general enough. You can make a new function in a variety of ways. So in the first place, you can define a new function uh, f plus g. You can define a new function f plus g, and the way that we'll define it is coordinate-wise. We'll define this by how do you evaluate the, the sum function f plus g evaluated at x? Mm -hmm. So that would be f of x plus g of x. So. What I want you to observe here is, is a distinction. And that is that this plus is not the same as this plus. I mean, they're written the same. <laughs> they're written the same. But this, this plus is adding together what kinds of things? This is, this is adding together reals. What kind of thing is this? That's a real. Once you've given an x to f, it's produced its, a real x to f, it's produced its output. So the kind of thing, the kind of thing that this is, this is a real. And this also is a real. So that means that this, is the, this addition is the sum of two reals. What is this? This is this is a function, right? You have yet to give it an input, so it's it's like awaiting to be given an input, right? And so is this one. So this, the kind of thing that this is, this thing is a function with signature real to real, and this thing is a function with signature real to real. So they're two different kinds of things. So what I'm telling you is that this sum function is a new function which takes reals to reals. And the way that it does it is this way. When you give the sum function an x, what it does is it gives the left function its x, and it gives the right function its x, and then adds them together with real addition. That's, that's how it performs its action. Okay. 
What's another besides adding functions? What can we do? You can multiply them. So f and then solid dot g. Okay, so now this is a function. That means that the kind of thing that this is, this is a this is a thing that takes reals to reals. Accepts a real input, produces a real output. How does the product function uh, evaluate. That is to say, what if we were to give it an x? Then what does it do? Might be f of x times g of x. Yeah, it gives it gives that x to the left function. It gives that same uh, x to the right function. And then it produces product. So this, this th they're denoted the same, but don't be confused. The one on the right is real product. The one on the left, this one right here, is product of functions because it's, it's different kinds of things. Okay, besides uh, product, what else? Compose. So I'll, I'll insert another one just by, I think you can figure it out what I mean by this. So a whole other one for that one, right? Divide, okay. Uh, compose, that's the interesting one, right? That you can make a new function, f composed with g. And now uh, it starts to become interesting how the composition function is evaluated. f composed with g, how, what does it do? Right. It first gives its argument to the right function. It gives it to, th to that one first. And lets, lets the right function, the one on the right, uh, produce its output. And then it takes the output of that and uses it as input to the left function. Ah. So, like this. So that means that you give, the, you give the real input to G and let it produce its output, and you take the real output of G and you use that as the real input to F. Interesting. Okay, so you're going to end up uh, having to, to do this. That is to say, you're going to have a homework assignment where you have to write a function that takes two functions, F and G, and re makes a new function that produces their sum. And similarly, another one for their product, another one for their quotient, difference in composition. Okay? But what I want to impress upon you, what I want to impress upon you is that there is a difference, <coughs> is that f, g, f plus g, f times g, F circ G, composed with G. A lot of young mathematicians refer to this as circ. Uh, the, that is to say the composition operator as circ. And the reason is because when, when you typeset a math whatever textbook exercise, you're almost always doing it in a programming language called LaTeX. And the name, of, the name of the command that produces this is circ, the first four letters of circle. <laughs> Uh -huh. that sound like <laughs> What's that? I said that? That does totally sound like something LaTeX would use, honestly. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's the, the way it is. So all of these, all of these are real to real. That's the kind of thing that they are. Whereas f of x, g of x, f plus g of x, f product g at x, and f circ g at x. What kind of things are all of these? Reals. These are all reals. Because writing, writing this signifies that you've, you've given each of these functions an input, and they've produced their output. Okay, so any question about this? 
Okay, let's try another idea. <clears throat> So this, this remark is about uh, the Gauss function. Which is also known as the pyramid function. Pyramid. That's PY, right? Okay. So it's called Gauss function because part of math apocrypha that's probably not true is that Gauss, is, Gauss was able to figure this out quite uh, when he was quite young. Okay? And it's called pyramid numbers because visually they look like pyramids. So here's the question. I could say, what if we make, what if we make a sequence of pyramids in the following way? So that's, a, that's one dot, and I'm saying that it's a, trivially a pyramid. Okay, so now I want to make a new, a new one where it's one dot is on top of two dots, like that. So you can think of like stacking up little two-dimensional balls. Okay, and so now this, this pyramid has height one, this pyramid has height two. Now I'd like for you to draw a pyramid of height three. So then how many need to how many little two dimensional balls need to be on the bottom row? Three six. <laughs> there there there'd be six altogether. Yeah. But there'd need to be three on the bottom row. Okay, now let's draw the next one. So to draw the next one, what I'd like for you to observe is you you can always start out by drawing the previous one. And then how, so that's the previous one. How many, how many balls do we need on the bottom? Four, Four right? So generally speaking, on the first row, on the topmost row, you need one. On the second row, you need two. On the third row, you need three. On the fourth row, you need four. And on the nth row, you need n. Okay? If you wanted to stack up little two-dimensional balls in this kind of pyramid. Okay. So <coughs> the question is, is supposing you wanted to make a pyramid that was, uh, say, 10 uh, rows high, like this, how many would you need? How many little balls would you need to, to accomplish this? Well, the answer would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus, 8 plus 9 plus 10, right? That's what you would need. But we'd like to be able to calculate this uh, as, as, as quickly as possible. Okay, so we're going to call the function, uh, how, this is n is 1, and this is n is 2, and this is n is 3, n is 4, and I didn't do another one. We're going to call Gauss of n, or just G of n, <coughs> is this sum, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n. OK, so here's the, what every math major must know about the apocryphal history of mathematics. So the story is, the story is that, uh, in the first place, there's a very famous mathematician uh, long dead now, named Gauss. Okay, and he was an incredibly intelligent person by all accounts. And he was, by this account, the, the this story I'm telling you that's probably not true, is that he was quite uh, misbehaved as a child and giving his teacher a very difficult time. So the teacher said, you know, thought to themselves, oh, I just need, I just need Mr. Gauss to just give me a break for just a few minutes. So teacher says to Gauss, okay, 
Mr. Gauss, I want you to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100, thinking that surely this will occupy him for a few minutes. Okay? So, <clears throat> so this is, well, it's, it's apocryphal, which is to say, I doubt it. I mean, it could be true. Gauss was a clever person, but th I don't think that there's anything historically. It's a good story. It's a good story. Yeah. yeah. So, so what the teacher requested of, of Mr. Gauss is that he would, he would produce this sum. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus uh, 98 plus 99 plus 100. And so Mr. Gauss... Here's what the teacher says, thinks for a minute, and then immediately responds with 5,050. And of course, the teacher is completely exasperated because it's the right answer. <laughs> now, <laughs> how did he come up with that? Well, uh, let's look. Let's consider this sum right here. How much is that if we add those together? 101, right? 101. So now suppose that we remove those from the list. And let's add the new first one with the new last one. What's the sum of 2 and 99? 101. OK, suppose we remove those. What's the sum of the new first one and the new last one? 101. And suppose we keep removing the first one and the last one. Where will we finally hit in the middle? 50 and 51. Okay, with just a little bit of bookkeeping. So how many times will we be able to take away 101? 50 times. Half, half of the number that are here, right? Because we're taking two each time, we're only going to get to take away 50 of them. So the answer is 5,050, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's the story of Mr. Gauss giving his teacher grief, which every, every good math major should know. OK, well. Here, what I'm about to say is not, exactly, is not exactly correct, it's not exactly a proof, but it's good enough for our purposes, is that notice that g of n has, has the uh, following shape, that we could say that this is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot, 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 plus n minus 2 plus n minus 1 plus n. So we could take away, how much is this? n plus 1. And suppose we take them away. Uh, not that one, this one. Then suppose we take this much away. How much is all of this? n plus 1, and the next one, <laughs> n plus 1, right? So then the question is, is how many times can we take away n plus 1? n over, n over 2 times. Now, there, there's something a little bit sloppy here, okay? Because the n over 2 thing only works if n happens to be even. Right? If, if, n, if n were an odd number, then we couldn't say that we can take away n plus, say, say it were 11. Then we wouldn't be able to take away 12 five and a half times. Or 11? Yeah, five and a half times. That wouldn't make any sense. Okay, so there is something a little bit sloppy, but what I'm just going to say without further comment is that it actually does end up working. The, one of the ways you can, you, you can prove it in a variety of ways with with um, induction, or you can just say, if, 
let's, let's assume that n is even, and then we prove it in the even case. And then you can say, now let's assume that n is odd and more than 1. Uh, then we can say n minus 1 is even, and then we can just add n in the end, and then it works. There's a lot of ways to get to it, but we're just going to ignore all that because it's not really relevant for our class. So we can take away n plus 1 n over 2 times, which is the famous formula for the Gauss function. n plus 1 times n, or usually it's n is on the left, n times n plus 1 over 2. So this is a formula for the Gauss function. That is to say, a closed form formula, something you could just plug in. Okay. Any question about, about this? So now we're going to look at a different way, at a different way to evaluate the Gauss function, one that doesn't use this exceptionally clever argument of a young Mr. Gauss. Rather, what we want is we want uh, a recursive definition, like the recursive definitions we've been dealing with on the previous pages. Okay, so let's think about it. To remind you, g of n should in any case be 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 all the way up to n. So that's what we want it to be. Let's come up with a recursive definition. That is to say, we're going to need g of n equal to some base cases, so some multiple cases here. So what do you think? What would be a reasonable base case? OK. Uh, 1 if n is 1. I like that. 0 if what? If n is 0. Okay, I like that. <laughs> and then we could, go, we could list a whole bunch of them, right? <laughs> like 20 of them, all the way down. <clears throat> but let's not. Let's just, let's just do the recursive case. So what, what will it be? There you go. N. So this, this is like building the pyramid from the bottom. So we're saying it's like g of n is going to be however many are, are on the bottom of the pyramid plus all of the stuff that, that is sitting on that bottom. Yes. g of n minus 1. So to help you kind of understand visually what this is saying, this is saying something like, this is saying something like, if we have a pyramid who's, that has four base elements like this, then the number of, the number of uh, little two-dimensional dots that are necessary, so we're going to need n for the base, and then we're going to need however much more are up here. So this represents all of these. And this represents the base. Okay, So it's like we're going to construct the pyramid one row at a time from the base up. Question? Yeah? No. <laughs> yeah, we, like, we just need this one. But I just keep writing them because I think people feel more comfortable if they get a win. So I'll call this one case one and this one case two. And I'm going igno to ignore the first one. <laughs> let's, let's do a couple evaluations to convince ourselves that this is right. So in particular, we can just look at this one directly and say, how many should there be? Well, that is to say, if we're doing a pyramid of height 4. So that'd be 4 plus 3, that's 7, plus 2, that's 9, plus 1, that's 10. So if we 
if we plug 4 into this function, we had better get 10. So let's see. G of 4. So, in, so which case will we be in? 1 or 2? Two? 2. We'll be in case 2. So then what do I need to put on the right hand side? 4 plus G of 3. Okay. That's the best, that, that's the first evaluation. So now, this is 4 plus, and now to evaluate g of 3, what do we, what do we need to put? 3 plus g of 2. 3 plus g of 2. Okay. So to evaluate this one, what do we need to do? <laughs> 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus g of 1. So 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus uh, 1 plus g of 0, if we're ignoring that first base case. If not, you know, you can have extra base cases, that's fine. Uh, then what's g of 0 finally? 0. zero. So does it work? It works. Incredible. Okay. So any question about uh, about this example? So these recursively defined functions, we're going to be doing things like this all semester. All semester. So um, I encourage you to get comfortable with them as soon as possible. So any questions before we move to something that's a little different? Yes? Right, the formula way? No. It, you, you mean the n times n plus 1 over 2 thingy? It, it is not using that. So we're just trying to get it to do the as basic as possible. Right. So, it, it, to, to, to be clear, the way it's going to work is that by the, by the end of the semester, we'll have at least three different ways to evaluate the Gauss function. And each of you is going to implement all three of them for the purposes of compare and contrast. Like, oh, well, I see. Uh, the, the formula way is much better because it requires no recursion. It's, it's very fast. OK, great. Then uh, you, know, you can compare that to the recursive case. You can re compare that to something else that we'll call uh, the loop case. But we haven't got to that yet. Other questions? Yes? When we're doing these uh, base cases that we have here, uh, will there be a case where, or I mean, a uh, point where we're going to need more than two base cases? Yes. Uh, it, I mean, not yet, but, but that will definitely occur. Okay. But since you brought it up, let's just do one. <clears throat> Now's as good a time as any to bring this up. So. You all, you, because you're math majors, you all know a recursively defined function that has two base cases. There's, an, there's a go-to example of this that all math majors know. What is it? Absolute value. Uh, but it's not recursively defined. Oh, yeah, that's true. That one. <laughs> Let's do that. Oh, boy. So the Fibonacci sequence. Fibo, how many B's are in Fibonacci? One and two C's. Fibonacci sequence. So written in kind of a um, sequence style, which you may have, which may be your previous experience. It's usually written something like this, that the uh, zeroth element of the Fibonacci sequence is 0. The first element of the Fibonacci sequence is 1. 
So you're given the first two, and then how do you find um, how do you find the nth one? Right. You take the previous two terms in the sequence and add them together. So the Fibonacci sequence, with the exception of the base cases, has the property that every term is the sum of the previous two terms. So it is like, it is like uh, the following. Uh, we, could, we could start listing them out. 0 and then 1. Those are the first two. That's just reading from the definition. What's the next one? 1. And the next? 2. And then 3. Five, so much fun, isn't it? Five, uh, <coughs> eight, <laughs> what comes next? Thirteen, etc. Okay. So every term, with the exception of the base cases, every term is the sum of the previous two terms. So now let's write it, uh, instead of in this sequence notation, let's write it in, in function notation. That is to say, suppose that we name our function f for Fibonacci, and it's f of n, so now it's going to have multiple cases. So how many cases must it have? Three, three right? It's gonna, it must have three because it has two base cases and one recursive case. Okay, so what's the first one? Zero, when n is zero. It is 1 when n is 1. And then what? Mm -hmm. It is f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 uh, otherwise. So here's an example of a recursively defined function that has more than one base case and there's there's um, n not any way really to get around that. Okay, so for fun, let's do one. Now, the Fibonacci sequence is another thing we're going to do in this class uh, for as a matter of just looking at it. And um, the, th this, is a, this is a mathematically correct way to define the Fibonacci sequence. But for the purposes of evaluating terms of the, of the Fibonacci sequence, this is a terrible way to do it. Terrible. Let's look and see just how terrible it is. In fact, I need a whole other page. Because that's what it's going to take, probably. Times it. So let's evaluate. Let's do, we'll do two of them. Let's start out by doing f of 4. We'll see how bad this gets. <laughs> so to evaluate f of 4, what is that? <coughs> right, that's f of 3 plus f of 2. OK. So then now, how about f of 3? What's that? OK, so that's f of 2 plus f of 1. And then what's this one? OK. So now, three of these can now be completely done, and then f of 2 becomes what? Right, so this becomes f of 1 plus f of 0, and then all of these are base cases, so this is plus uh, 1 plus 1 plus 0, and then this one 
is 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0. So that ends up being 3. Okay, so the first thing I'd like for you to observe is that, is that notice how many times we had to evaluate f of 1. We had to do it there. Uh, and there, and there. So we had to do it three times. Okay, and how many times did we have to evaluate um, f of zero? Twice, right? There and there. Okay, fun. Now let's do, <laughs> if we can, let's do f of five. And I'd like for you to observe that even though we're just going one more, <laughs> we're just increasing the evaluation one more time, I'd like to, for you to observe how sad the situation is. Okay, so this would be f of 4 plus f of 3. And to, to be clear, to be clear, um, because, because we have this, that means we're going to have to re this one by itself. That means that we're going to have to reproduce this whole, this whole computation one more time. Okay, and because we have this, that means that we're going to have to reproduce all of that computation one more time. So, so let's do it, because why not? So this would be f of three plus f of two, and this one over here would be f of two plus f of 1. That one. That would be f of 2 plus f of 1, and then plus f of 1 plus f of 0, and then plus f of 1 plus f of 0, and then we finally get to write not an f. So to make sure that it's clear what's happening is that this one spawned that one and that one. This one spawned that one and that one. This one spawned that one and that one. This one made that one and that one. Uh, is that right? Yeah. This one made that one and that one and that one became that one. Okay. So now f of 2, that's f of uh, 1 plus f of 0, and then this one becomes just 1 plus that one becomes 1, that one becomes 0, this one 1, this one 0, and this one is still 1. <coughs> so this one made that one and that one. That one is that one, that one is that one, that one is that one. And now finally we're going to evaluate all f's. <coughs> Which is what? Five. That's a pretty convoluted r way to write five, isn't it? <laughs> it gets worse very quickly, okay, extremely quickly. In fact, the number of little red arrows that you're going to need actually grows exponential with the input. That is to say that if you wanted to, in principle, a human probably by hand could evaluate, say, the 20th Fibonacci number in this style but you would have no hope of doing it by hand if you wanted to evaluate, say, the 30th one. Your hand would just cramp up and fall off. Okay, you wouldn't be able to do it. There'd be too many of them. Now, that's not to say that, you, that no human could ever evaluate the 30th Fibonacci number, because after all, we were almost there just doing it this way, right? So you, you really could do it, but just not this way. Okay, there's, there's other ways, and we're going to talk about those other ways to go about doing this, but we're not going to talk about them right now.
Good. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So now, we, we already talked about the multiplication function, the function that can take any natural and any real, any natural n and any real x, and produce n times x, but only using addition. So we already talked about that function, and we wrote it. It's in the notes from the previous page. But what I'd like for you to observe <coughs> about that that multiplication function looks something like this, the multiplication of n and x. We said it was something like uh, 0 <coughs> if n is 0. <coughs> and we had a, a bunch of other cases. But the only case that's necessary is that it will be x multiplied by the multiplication of n minus 1 and x otherwise. Of course, n has to be a natural <coughs> in order for this function to be well-defined. So if I asked you to compute, if I asked you to compute, say, the mul multiplication of, uh, no, I, we're, I'm, doing, I'm doing multiplication. So this, sh this one needs plus. So if we do the multiplication of, say, 3 and uh, 7, then what is, this, what is this function saying? Mm -hmm. Right. It's 7 plus the multiplication of 2 and 7. And then it is... 7 plus 7 plus the multiplication of 1 and 7. <coughs> and then it is 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus the multiplication of 0 and 7. But that's the base case, right? So 7 plus 7 plus <coughs> 7 plus 0. So is that really 3 times 7? Yes? So like on the written homework. Like, do we have to write out that final answer? I want to see it just like this. Okay. I want to see it just like this because remember, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say it a bunch of times this semester. One of the best ways to learn something is to have, something, have someone to teach it to. Okay? And you're, in, in, the, in the end, every time you write a program, you're trying to teach MATLAB to do something. And MATLAB is the dumbest thing you're ever going to deal with. <laughs> It's not dumb it's, or smart, uh, but the thing is it's going to do exactly what you say. So I want you to get used to doing exactly what is said. So if, if I were to ask you to do this, the multiplication of, say, 2370 and 7, then hopefully you would just object and say, I'm not doing it. <laughs> right? Okay, because d do you observe that the way it works is that this first argument, this first argument, which on the, the previous one is 3, and then it's 2, and then it's 1, and then it's 0, like that, it's counting down by 1. So if we were, if I were to ask you to do this, then, and I was to ask you to do it in this way, that would be just a, a mess. Okay, you'd have to do 2,370 lines of this, and it would just be like one enormous triangle where you're just collecting all these <laughs> sevens. Okay? So, now, I, I hope that this raises a question for you because we're using uh, a computer to perform multiplication, arithmetic essentially. And there's, there's no magical um, like multiplication juice or fairy dust inside of the computer. How is it doing it? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's not this way. This would be terribly slow, yeah? Could it use the commutative property and switch the numbers and then do 2370 seven times added? 
I like that. I like that. Would, wouldn't that work good? But the problem would be, what if I did 7.5? But I, I agree that in this, in, in this particular case, that would work. And then you don't only have to do it seven times. Well, what if you did 2370 times 2370, and that, like, that would be a mess, too? <laughs> if, if, yeah, right? And if both numbers were big, yeah. then it, it could be a problem either way. Yeah? Like in mental math, and then we do a half and double kind of thing. So we, we change one into each other so that the multiplication is still correct. So like have 20 through 70, but double 7. OK. So and in fact, this, this is what the machine does. So let, let's, explain, let's explain this now. So suppose, suppose that um, I wanted you, I want you to compute say, uh, 128x for some given x. But I want you to use only additions. Right? You're not allowed to use multiplication. So you're not allowed to do that. OK, so since for some of you, for some, since, since this may be the first time you're seeing this idea, observe that I could say, OK, I'm going to call x1, I'm going to call that x. OK, now the next one, x2, I'm going to say that that's x1 plus x1, because in height. So how much, to, we're keeping track here, uh, this would be, this would be 1x. How much is this? This is 2x, right? So x3 is going to be what? X3x. No, well, we can do better. How about x2 plus x2? What, what, is it, what, what do we have now? Four. That's now 4x. OK. What's x4 going to be? And how much is that? That's uh, 8x. So for those of you who are, who are visual folks, what I want you to see is that what we're doing is we're taking this one and making two copies of it and adding it. That's, that's the pattern. So we're doubling each time, e each line we double. So then x5 would be x4 plus x4. And how much would that be? 16x. <coughs> this would be uh, x5 plus x5. So this one was 16, so this one is 32. How much is this one? 64. And there we have it. That's 128x. So this one, uh, this one was 16x. This one was 32x, 64x, and 128x. So now, if we were to use that multiplication, yes? I was just going to say, like, what if it wasn't in multiple We're going to get to that. Okay. If we were to use, if we were to use, um, the multiplication function that's on the previous page, how many steps would, have, would it have taken? 128. 128. How many steps did it take here? Eight. It took, if you count that one, then it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, 8 steps. 8's better than 128, right? I think mm -hmm. we can agree on that. So, 
it works for 128. Another number it would work for is 1,024. If we wanted to, if we wanted to multiply something by 1,024, how many steps would it take? Eleven. If you count this one, it would take eleven. What if you wanted to? Do I have my calculator? <laughs> What if we wanted to multiply by 65,536? Then it would take 17 steps. One more than that number there. It would take 17 steps uh, because each time we're doubling it, right? We'd only have to do one more step to get to 256 x's, and then one more to get to 512, and one more to get to 1,024, and just a few more to get to that number and lots of other very big numbers, okay? So then, I'm fishing for, now, now I'm asking, what, what does eight have to do with 128? And I'm fishing for an L word. Log base two plus one. Yeah, it's the logarithm base two of this number and one more. The logarithm base two of 128 is seven, and then one more is eight. That's the number of steps. If, if you count this one as a step. If you don't count that one as a step, then exactly logarithm base two. Okay. So even, even numbers that are on the order of size four billion, if I asked you, if you use the previous multiplication function, the previous one, and I said, I want you to do four billion x, then you'd have to do four billion steps. That's not acceptable. Okay. But if you, if you could somehow arrange to do this doubling thing, then it would take approximately how many steps? Log, Log base 2 of 4, 000, 4, 4 billion, which is what? Everyone should know this. <laughs> base knowledge. 32. 32. Right? The reason why all of you should know this is, for one thing, you're a math major, and for a second thing, this is now a programming class. What's the, what is the largest number that can be represented by a 32-bit integer? About 4.2 billion. Okay, so this is just little information you should, you should know. So just, so you should, you should be familiar with the powers of two all the way up to 32. You should be able to have a general knowledge of how big they are, yeah? Who uses 32 bits? I'm sorry? I said who uses 32 bits? No one these days. No one these days, but, but you still, but everyone needs to know. Well, let's say this. Almost all timekeeping in, in uh, a lot of computers uses a 32-bit integer, which is counting the number of seconds since 1970. Yeah, so that's an important bit of knowledge because in 2038, we're, that's gonna, we're going to go beyond the, the, the 4.2 billion seconds since 1970, and that could be a big problem, bigger than the Y2K problem, if you ever heard of that. <laughs> So, the thing that we're going to talk about next time is we're going to talk about how to multiply. So, someone made an objection, and that is that this process would not work if that number were not a power of 2. Okay, what we want to do is we want to come up with a way that can multiply as quick as this, but not just for powers of 2, even for things that are not powers of 2. Okay, and that's the first thing we'll talk about. Uh, next time, which is, which is next Thursday because what's happening on Tuesday? We'll be in the lab. Okay, have a nice day.